My name is Kamalan Chiravnan. Uh I'm currently a student at NYU. I just finished my junior year. Um, I'm also the co-founder to a nonprofit called Voices. So Voices, uh, I founded when I was 14 years old. We are an organization dedicated to uplifting the lives of abused women and children, specifically those stateless. Uh, we primarily run two programs. One is a volunteering program for orphans that were abandoned by rape survivors and rape victims. And we run a funding program for shelters uh, for stateless people near the border of Thailand and Burma. So allow me to tell you a little bit about um, how I ended up here, uh, I guess, at a relatively young age. So I grew up in a family, uh, a family business of agro-industrial uh, market. And um, contrary to, you know, stigmas surrounding big businesses that there are only about profit making and CSR is about PR. I never found that. So ever since I was young, I was greatly inspired by my father and my aunt's CSR programs. And so that was where my passion started. My family never uh, kind of pushed me to do family business. Uh, they gave me a whole array of opportunities uh, to figure out what I was passionate about and what I wanted to pursue. And uh, so that led me to co-founding Voices, and now I'm studying social work and social entrepreneurship at NYU in New York. When I was in middle school, which is when I started this organization, I was volunteering at many orphanages around Thailand, and um, just because I had a passion for helping little children. Uh, but soon I learned that a lot of these children were abandoned by rape survivors, and I guess with you know, the, green, the growing curiosity of teenagers, I was constantly trying to get to root causes of these issues. And, um, but at that age, shelters in Thailand weren't really open to having a group of uh, high school students interview rape survivors and rape victims because it's a very sensitive issue. And so I decided to go to the more rural parts of Thailand where they were more desperate for help. And this led me to traveling to Masad in a province called Chiang Rai near the northern of Thailand uh, with a great population of stateless people. At that time, I thought that I'd only be meeting with rape survivors. But little did I know, the shelter that I went to uh, were all children and women that were stateless. And so this is where I learned that um, underserved women and children are already at risk for abuse, rape, and trafficking. But if you add statelessness into the equation, the risks is, is heightened beyond what would be inhumane. The children I work with, they range from infants to kids that are, were my age at that time, which was 14. Uh, when I was 14, one of the first uh, girls I met who had been raped uh, was the same age as me. And so this is something that is very dear to my heart and something I'm very passionate about. So a little bit about statelessness uh, is a person who is not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. And this means that stateless people have no national identification and have no access to rights under the national law. Um, also Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, also states that nationality is an inherent right to which all human beings should be entitled to. So the world's current stateless population that is reported is 10 million people. Uh, in ASEAN, there's 1.7 million. And in Thailand, which is where I'm from, is 443,862. Uh, the reason why I would like to emphasize report, however, is that um, stateless people, especially generational stateless people that I will clarify on later, live their lives in the shadows, in fear of persecution. So their lives aren't documented by governments of any state. And so I think it's safe to assume that in all these statistics, there are much more. So I think the best example and the best descriptions of these issues are real stories. This is a woman who I call Sunshine, just to protect her identification. She's the first uh, stateless woman that has been through abuse, trafficking, uh, and various forms of rape uh, that I met and that opened up to me and told me her story. This is a picture that I took from the first time I met her uh, in 2010. 
And this is my latest picture that I had with her in 2014. Um, this is her youngest son. Uh, she has two toddlers. Both children were born through rape. Uh, they never met their father. Their mother does not know who their father is. Um, I call her Sunshine, however, because the first time I met her, I wasn't aware of her plight. And her smile just shone through me. And when I learned that for the past six to seven years of her life, she has been abused, raped, and trafficked. Uh, every time she'd cross the border from Burma to Thailand, uh, she'd be raped by soldiers or just, you know, anyone who had that intention near the border because stateless people, they don't have the ability uh, or they fear that if they report the abuses against them, they'll be incarcerated for actually being in the country. And so they're voiceless in some sense. She had a boyfriend that she mentioned and um, who beat her. And so I was curious as to why she would stay with someone who beat her. And I, so I asked her, um, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have, but because I was very curious at that time, I asked her if she ever loved her boyfriend. And she said yes. She said she loved him because he didn't rape her, he only beat her. And so that was her definition of love. Um, so this photo was taken half a year before she went back to visit her mother uh, in Burma. And she was falsely accused and sentenced to 12 years in prison on the Burmese side. Uh, she's currently still in prison. Um, when I finally heard from her, she expressed that other than missing her two children, she felt safer in prison. So can you imagine if love meant abuse and safety meant incarceration? So it's important to note that these things that they go through has been going on for decades, maybe even centuries, because of the voicelessness that like triggered by their fear of persecution. Um, her child, her children, has no rights to education, uh, future employment, as, she, as does she. Uh, they have no rights to anything that we would be, have the rights to. Uh, on this very day when I arrived, her child was having a very high fever, but was unable to seek help from any hospitals because of his lack of national identification. And so we had to scramble through and find um, the nearest pharmacy and just buy you know, over-the-counter fever medication. This child also has a defected lung uh, and he, until today he has no access to the rightful health care. And um, she has two children, one child we believe although th though there's no proof that she was born on the Burmese side. However, her youngest son was born on the Thai side. But yet, even though he was born on the Thailand side, he has no an national identification. Um, Thailand's Nationality Act, though it has been revised and has been improving um, from 2012 to 2016, the Thai government has granted citizenship to 23,000 stateless people. However, the Nationality Act still emphasizes that one parent of the child must be of Thai nationality or the child themselves to have a Thai birth certificate to prove to the authorities. Uh, most stateless children are not afforded birth certificates when they are born. And so that is, that is their life. Um, that is what they're entitled to and what they're not entitled to. Um, and so... I'd like to close this section with um, asking you if this is what we would categorize as being human. If you see her and her children right now, they're no different to one of us. The only difference that they have is their status, is their legal status. Uh, some were not born in Thailand, some were born in Thailand, but... Um, are they not entitled to basic human rights such as health care, education, and employment? And if they're not, uh, they're subjected to being involved in the illegal jobs that 
that is burdening our country. So by not accepting them, we are also burdening our country. Whereas most uh, government officials would say that by accepting them, it is the burden. So it's kind of a conflicting um, standpoint where uh, most stateless people who are adults that are from generational descent um, are involved in drug trafficking. And this is because they have no opportunities to do any other job. Uh, but yet, because they're involved in criminal activity, they are all labeled as criminals. But for children, how are we to say that a four-year-old child or a two-year-old child is a criminal just because of their legal status? I personally believe that nobody should be legally invisible. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open to questions now. Can you share with us some of the projects that you have worked on under uh, Voices? So what have you done to, um, you know, to these stateless uh, people? So as I previously mentioned, we primarily run uh, two funding programs, but I guess uh, for our uh, volunteering program, it is not specifically uh, for stateless people. It is uh, run at an orphanage in Thailand that were left by rape survivors. But for the stateless people, we have funded two uh, shelters in the same uh, province of Chiang Rai that support stateless people. Uh, about 90% of these uh, shelters uh, are children, uh, and the 10% would be women. Uh, we rarely see men coming to these shelters because they are those who are, um, I guess, still working uh, in the drug trafficking um, area. Uh, where women seek refuge uh, when they cross the borders with their children. Um, so we provide them with um, basic medical aid, medical care. Um, I also have uh, been working with a lawyer from UNHCR to work on s possible cases that we could help them get citizenship. Whereas, But I would say that around 20% of all the children we've worked with, their cases are able to be appealed but uh, for most cases, it's, it's almost helpless if the Nationality Act doesn't get reformed further. We also uh, provide funding through like fundraising. Um, recently, it's been uh, more through the channel of donations, but uh, when we were more active in high school, um, uh, I think it's also important to note that this organization was formed when uh, my whole team we're the same age, we're 14, and we're high school friends. Um, when we graduated high school, we are now in different universities all around the world. So it's hard to really um, come together and do the kind of fundraising activities as we did. But for about four years, we ran various fundraising activities such as charity concerts, um, the classic bake sales, and um, selling the products that the stateless women uh, were making would bring them back to Bangkok and sell them at various uh, venues. So I understand that you've worked with the UNHCR. Um, I'm Thai as well. And Thailand, I think to convince the government you need a certain, I'm not sure who, but a certain kind of organization or individuals with certain leverage. So my question is, who do you think are those individuals or organizations, apart from UNHCR, with that leverage? And currently, are they engaged with this effort at all? I'd like to credit um, uh, Dr. Kitipong Kitearak, who used to be our former uh, minister, uh, secretary, permanent secretary of justice. Uh, currently, he is... Um, operating and the director of uh, Thailand's uh, Institute of Justice. I really believe that this institute is one of the key components to driving this forward. And the reason why I say this, and maybe not so much as the UNHCR, is because I think in Thailand we still have this sense of, I'm not sure if it's false, but perhaps misplaced sense of nationalism, where we tend to trust more to those with our national identification, which is also a problem why we have so much distrust with these stateless people. Um, and, but however, because the Thailand Institute of Justice is run by Thai people and by a respected Thai figure, I believe that they have a lot of um, influence in this area. But I still believe that the, the key people who can really make a difference are legislators and Thai politicians, if they can 
shift their focus from the differences that we have with them to the similarities, I think that that, that is our driving force. There is the feeling that there is, at work, an unstoppable force applied to an immovable rock. In other words, the, the UN states that everybody is entitled to a nationality, and yet every country dictates what are the conditions that are necessary to, to fulfill in order to get that nationality. What is the stick that the UN has in order to help these, uh, these people? And, and it doesn't need to be applied specifically to Thailand, but, but somewhere to the nexus, whether it's Myanmar, whether it's, it's Laos, whether it's uh, countries in the region where you have these, um, these people without nationality. So the UN de Declaration of Human Rights, however, um, I think especially in developing countries, have not been signed by them. So it is up to uh, the prime ministers of each country to sign these Declaration of Human Rights. And the countries that have signed this Declaration of Human Rights have uh, policies and laws and processes to help the stateless people. But for countries that have yet to sign these human rights, they still have that room for discrimination and uh, segregation with these areas. So I think if we can push the, the various governments who have yet to sign the UN Declaration of Human Rights to sign the UN Declaration of Human Rights, I think that that, that would be a, a great starting point. i like to also maybe provide what I think we should start with. Um, and I think, you know, trying to get citizenship for people for the past few years um, of my life, I find that because there's so much distrust, especially with the, the adult uh, generation of the stateless people, because of uh, the various uh, illegal jobs that they might be involved in, I think that it might help to start with children. Because I feel like if we start with children, um, there's very little that can be refuted um, about the rights that these child are entitled to as human beings. Um, and there is no chance that an infant can be uh, categorized as a criminal. Do you have any success stories? Like in the times that you've been working with these women and children, I mean either be it adults or children that have actually been able to get citizenship? Um, so I, I guess I'd like to do a success story and a story of something that I've yet to succeed in. Um, so her children um, in Thailand, uh, even though they are not granted citizenship, we have been able to give both her children uh, what in Thailand would categorize as a pink card. And so these pink card assure that they are legally able to stay in our country. Um, however, these pink cards don't entitle them to any rights to employment uh, or, or health care. It entitles them to education until fifth grade um, and residency. So I, f personally, I wouldn't say this is a success, but um, with all the legal uh, cumbersome standpoints, I think uh, if we can start by the pink cards and work on reforming the justice system to provide, I guess, more rights, uh, under the pink card, um, I think that that would really help. Um, but as for, as for Sunshine, she is still incarcerated in Burma. I just want to um, ask you a question about uh, the Rohingya, which are considered stateless by many more countries, right? The way from Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. And here there's a little bit of uh, uh, cultural similarity. Uh, looks wise as well these other people unfortunately we have to use that word other people are completely alien how is that happening and are you interacting and you've seen uh, the rohingya also getting involved in in, in in these issues because up in indonesia down in indonesia we are also getting that and not that we're handling it very well um, and what's been your interaction with that um, I have to say that um, stateless people, there's, I guess, kind of two categories that we could 
define their origin from. Uh, some were born stateless, some became stateless. And Ro the Rohingya population is an example of stateless people who became stateless. They were stripped of their national ident identification uh, in hopes that they would find a safer and new and better life. Um, however, the population that I have been working with um, are a little different. Uh, so I have more experience with people who are generational stateless. Um, but if I could uh, provide some opinion on the Rohingya, um, I think that, like as I previously mentioned, we all are not only you know, visibly similar, we're all also part of the same region. Um, and so maybe it would help to expand our definition of nationalism into nationalism. So if we're all part of the same region, why are we still kind of still pushing the responsibilities to all the other regions that are still struggling just as our own? Uh, most of us are still from developing countries. And so um, efforts such as migration dialogues and uh, migration compacts between these developing countries would definitely solve the or at least help alleviate the plight of the Rohingyas. I think the communication between these countries involved must be uh, much more improved. Um, and the sense of responsibility to our nation must also be extended to the sense of responsibility for all human beings. Does your organization get involved in maybe placements like through international adoptions and things so because I guess there's a lot of groups of people who can't have children of their own for, for whatever reason whether that's medical or social um, and are there channels that you've you've worked with the UN or other national governments through international adoptions perhaps? Um, sadly um, it is illegal to adopt a stateless child because the stateless the child <laughs> yes. um, so uh, Obviously, uh, legal adoptions are, 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 are very safe and um, detailed as a nature as they are because it is the life of you know, children. Um, so if a child doesn't have national identification, they don't have access to be part of the adoption agencies. So these, uh, these shelters, uh, they're just there. And what we can provide them with, which actually, um, I guess, uh, I forgot to mention that we do provide them with um, I guess, vocational training um, for these children to hopefully one day be able to apply for citizenship themselves if they have been in Thailand for long enough and have proven to be a productive participation of our nation to apply for themselves. But in terms of adoption, sadly, it is, it is not currently a possibility.